My uncle took the blood from my finger, and he gets this tissue, a piece of Kleenex, and puts the blood on the Kleenex. And Phil told me, he said, I want you to make believe this tissue paper is a picture of a saint. And what I'm going to do, Philip, I'm going to cup, I want you to cup your hands. I'm going to light this piece of tissue paper on fire. And as it's burning in your hands, I want you to say, may I burn like this saint if I betray my friends. And keep saying it and keep juggling the paper, which I did, until it burns out. And when it burned out, he put his hands over mine and he rubbed the ashes into my palms. Then he made me kiss him on both cheeks. I went around the circle, I kissed everybody else on both cheeks. Then he told me to stand outside the circle. He made everybody join hands. He said something in Italian, which broke the circle. Then he told me to join the circle, hold hands, which I did. He said something else in Italian, and it made me part of the circle. It means I was a made member after that. Once you are proposed and you're told you can become a member, there's no backing out. If you try to back out, you die. <laughs> what happens, you're with somebody, a soldier, and he starts teaching you. Then maybe you go on a hit, either you drive a car, or maybe you do the actual shooting so you could get made. It's got to be blood in the sand. You got to participate in a murder. And this is how you, you become a member. And once you become a member, become part of a family that is so powerful, it's like the second government. It's like dying and going to heaven when you get made. The power, I mean, is just unlimited. John Gotti, until recently the most notorious mafia boss in America. For a decade, Gotti flouted all attempts to put an end to his criminal career. He became public enemy number one. Over the next three weeks, we reveal the extraordinary inside story of America's war against the mafia. A battle fought with sophisticated electronic surveillance and testimony from insiders. A succession of Mafia defectors have put Gotti and his fellow Mafia bosses in jail for life. Omerta, the vow of silence under pain of death, is no longer sacred. Philip Leonetti and Lawrence Merlino... Philip Leonetti pled guilty to seven murders and planned countless others. He ran Philadelphia and Atlantic City for the mob. He is one of the highest ranking figures ever to betray the Mafia. Tonight, he speaks for the first time on television. Just let us go by. Excuse us. Everybody would be looking to kill me. I testified against a lot of families. I have people all over the country uh, looking to kill me. And I'm very careful, and I'm going to do it, make the best of it, the, the best I could do. Leonetti spent just five years in jail for his crimes. Today, he is a protected witness. John Gotti is amongst those he betrayed to earn his freedom. I went to a grand jury and I told them everything I knew about John and the meetings we had, about him saying he killed Paul Castellano, about him saying he got the okay from the commission. And I would testify about the family, him being the boss, the structure of his family, those who betray the Mafia are under sentence of death. John Gotti would kill anybody, anytime, any place, and just the snap of a finger, he'd issue contracts to kill people.
Today, John Gotti is serving a life sentence without parole in America's maximum security jail at Marion, Illinois. We are the final stop in the security ladder uh, as an inmate has worked his way into this type of facility. Putting Gotti behind bars was the FBI's greatest coup against the Mafia. It was achieved by placing bugs in the Ravenite Club, the secret headquarters of America's most powerful Mafia family. With the matter of days, we knew that John Gotti would be our best witness at any future trials. He was loose. He should have been more careful, especially after the first case. He should have been more careful where he talked. He was very loose like that. And he's paying for it now. Before paying the penalty for his crimes, Gotti was the most powerful godfather in America, the latest in a long line of mafia bosses to run New York's Gambino family. He inherited the riches of an underworld empire whose power and influence stretch back more than half a century. In the early 1900s, it was the prospect of wealth and a better life that attracted the immigrants from the old world, and it was those who turned to crime and extortion who became the founding fathers of the American Mafia. Italian immigrants settled in their own neighborhoods, importing a distrust for the authority of their new country and exporting the traditions of secret societies like the Mafia from Sicily. It's a way of life, it's a way you're brought up, and it's something that started way back from when the Italian people first came over here and they were they were like suspicious of law enforcement people because the law enforcement people at that time were a lot of Irish people and actually they didn't get along with the Italians and they didn't get no relief when they went to courts. So, you know, it's, they started. They started their own thing to help one another. And this formed out of society. You know, the mafia formed one way. This is La Cosa Nostra. It's different. This is our thing. Our thing, Cosa Nostra, is the name given to the American Mafia. From Italy, they brought a structure and tradition with its roots in the armies of ancient Rome and the Mafia families of Sicily. Cosa Nostra consists of a hierarchy of ascending ranks, from the soldiers on the street to the commanding officer, the head of the family, the godfather. The boss, he's the boss of the family. The buck stops with him. He oversees everything, every family function. And he's the only guy that can make somebody. Then you have the other boss who takes over when the boss isn't around. Or, you know, whatever the boss tells him to do, he does. And then you have the captains. The captains, they'll report to the boss or the other boss, whichever way the boss wants it, and lets them know what's going on. And you have the soldiers who report to the captains. They let their captain know what they're doing in business, or even, even like with our family, if you're going to go on a vacation, you let your captain know where you're going, you leave where you're going to be, and when you're coming back, just in case we need you. And then you have the associates that everybody has, you know, to hang around, that are money, some guys are money makers, that are protected by our family. The consigliere is the counselor to the boss. He counsels the boss, if there's any problems, if the boss decides to kill anybody, talks to the consigliere about it and uh, asks his opinion and states the reason why he wants to kill this guy. And then he weighs it and see if he's right. And he'll, he'll agree with him or disagree. But they always agree with the boss, you know. The boss is the boss. For half a century, this secret and highly organized crime syndicate was almost untouchable. In the 1940s and 50s, one of the most notorious bosses was Albert Anastasia, known as the Mad Hatter. He ran his own group of contract killers, Murder Incorporated, and seized power by killing his previous boss. 
Well, he took over the family from uh, Vincent Mangano. And from what I hear, he had Mangano killed. And then he just went, he was just out of hand. You know, he was killing people for, uh, for nothing. And um, somebody had to take him out because he was just running amok. And then he was charging for memberships, um, which is against everything that supposedly they stand for. But I think it was just more of a reason to get him killed than, you know, than anything else. Twenty years later, history repeated itself. The barbershop murder of Albert Anastasia was organized by Carlo Gambino, paving the way for Gambino's succession. These are the home movies of a mafia family. The young Dominic was brought up by his uncle, Nino Gaggi, an up-and-coming mafioso. The well-dressed men who were frequent guests at the family home were in fact some of New York's most dangerous gangsters. Carlo Gambino and his brother-in-law Paul Castellano, later to head the family, are amongst his earliest childhood memories. The earliest was um, from when I was real young, uh, four or five years old, just at family, um, family gatherings, birthday parties, anniversaries. It was very big with them, so everybody would always uh, gather in 40, 50 people, you know, and they were all there, Carlo, Paul, um, of course my uncle. Um, people, a lot of people that I didn't know at the time, who later turned out to be, you know, um, pretty big people. Anastasia's execution heralded a period of uncertainty. The danger was that his supporters would seek revenge on those who had killed him. Alliances had to be formed to avoid a vendetta. When, after Albert got killed in um, Manhattan, we kind of all locked down in the house. Nobody went out of the house. Everybody stayed in because they didn't know if there was going to be a full-fledged war. And that's, that's actually when Carlo took over, after Albert was killed. And um, then everything kind of, I remember like everything was kind of changed because um, when Carlo took over, everybody's stock went up. You know, my uncles included, you know, Paulie's. Um, that was about the earliest memories, I'd say from five to ten years old. You know, I remember it like it was yesterday. In the early autumn of 1957, with the support of the other families, the way was now clear for Carlo Gambino, the illegal immigrant from Sicily, to become the new boss. This was the birth of the Gambino family. A sweet little old man, you know. He uh, he was small, you know. He looked he looked like he wouldn't hurt a fly, you know a fly. Very quiet, you know, soft spoken. He was very much like a grandfather type, you know. Um, especially when you're a kid, because you don't you don't know what he does. I didn't know what anybody in the family did. You know, I just knew nobody really got up and went to work. By chance, Mafia bosses were arrested as they gathered to hold a summit meeting in the autumn of 1957 to ratify the changes in leadership precipitated by the murder of Albert Anastasia. Three weeks later, three weeks following uh, the assassination of Albert Anastasia, out of sequence, all of the La Cosa Nostra organizations around the United States had a national meeting a national commission meeting. It was held at Appalachia, New York, a rural area in the upper part of New York State. Uh, and we know now that one of the purposes of that was to explain uh, who was now in charge in New York. Vito Genovese has taken over from Frank Costello. Uh, Albert Anastasia is no more, and Carlo Gambino will now be uh, the head of that family. With news of the Appalachian arrests, America woke up to discover organized crime on a scale they had never dreamt of. When, when as a recorded fact, you apprehended 
uh, 66 out of more than 100 people at one location who had come from Northern California, Southern California, the state of Colorado, uh, the state of Arizona, had come from Illinois, had come from Ohio, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Uh, America had never dreamed up till that moment that such a convocation could or did happen. Appalachian was proof not only of the Mafia, but also of their secret government, the Commission. Yet those arrested were soon released, and it would be almost another three decades before there was sufficient evidence to prosecute the Commission itself. Uh, the Commission is the power, is the strength of the, of the mob. They, uh, they, sometimes there's always problems, and they sort of work them out. There could be problems with bosses. There could be problems with a lot of things. So they have a commission for this reason, you know, to stay united. But they, they have everything to say. They usually set the, the rules and everything. But it changes over the years because you get new commission bosses and so forth and so on. Right now, I don't think they got a commission because it seems like everybody's in jail, all the commission bosses. They're made up of the boss of each family in New York, the five families. And Philadelphia had a seat on the commission, and also Chicago. They're very powerful. They run the La Cosa Nostra families all over the United States. They're the ones that makes the laws for all the families. And they're the laws everybody has to abide by. They're like our Supreme Court. Take your right hand. You solemnly swear. The testimony she'll give shall be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Despite the revelations of Appalachian and court hearings that followed, it was nearly three decades before the commission itself was prosecuted. Union Street. How long have you lived there? The roots of mafia power were embedded deep within American society, nowhere more so than within the most powerful labor unions of New York. Control of the Brooklyn waterfront enabled organized crime to extort businesses and divert union funds. What do you do for a living? Long with Sherman Stevedore. How long have you been uh, engaged in that? Since I remember, sir. All right. Uh, counsel. Mr. Anastasio, have you ever been arrested? I don't know what you mean, I was arrested, sir. I did was arrested. Well, you know what I mean. I'm the charge of somebody else to come out free, sir. Now, would you forget being arrested for homicide? I just told you, I did was arrested, sir. When was that? In 1925. That's right. And uh, what was the uh, charge made against you at that time? I don't recall, sir. The union was part of the Gambino family. Anthony Anastasia died in 1963. But the control of the union by the Gambinos survived through a family connection. It is better for us as a union to get longer contracts Anthony Scotto had succeeded his father-in-law, Anthony Anastasia, both uh, as the head of the Longshoremen's Union in Brooklyn and as a capo in the Gambino family. Uh, his political influence was very, very strong. Uh, he had served as the Kings County Chairman uh, for the election of Jimmy Carter uh, when Jimmy Carter became President of the United States. Uh, at the time, he was being investigated by the FBI. Uh, President Carter was coming to New York to attend uh, a, a big uh, labor luncheon, uh, and he had the White House call Anthony Scotto to find out would he be attending that dinner uh, because he wanted to chat with him about the upcoming election in 1980. Uh, Anthony Scotto turned from that conversation with a, a staff person in the White House to someone in his office and said, you know, they say the FBI is investigating me, but they can't be that very close to me. Otherwise, wouldn't they tell the President of the United States not to call me or come and see me? That's how powerful he was. He could be dealing directly 
with the President of the United States as a political ally. Scotto's political connections were the legacy of the skills and powers of the godfather himself, Carlo Gambino. The Longshoremen's Union was just one of the unions they controlled. When I was with the family, he had all the unions, uh, the Garmin Center, the docks, um, a lot of gambling, loan sharking, and it was a big shush-shush, but um, narcotics. You know, he had all the connections in Sicily. You know, that was, that was the mainstay. When the heroin business really moved from France to Sicily, he had, you know, all the connections there. You know, he used to have, on 18th Avenue in Brooklyn, there's a lot of the, uh, what they call the greaseballs. They're Sicilians from Sicily. And he had all of them. They were all loyal to Carlo. You know. In public, Carlo Gambino described himself as a labor relations consultant. In private, control of unions gave him power over some of New York's major industries. Carlo Gambino saw the future of the mob in legitimate business, and he understood that that relationship between organized crime and legitimate business had to be strengthened. Uh, these were not just uh, uh, gangsters back then. They were uh, uh, good businessmen and great politicians. They knew how to work the system. They worked the system so well that it responded by virtually ignoring the growth of organized crime. Despite the occasional arrest, the Mafia's power survived the 50s through to the 70s virtually unscathed. The FBI under J. Edgar Hoover stubbornly refused to acknowledge the existence of the American Mafia. This young gangster, Vincent the Chin Gigante, was arrested in 1957. Vinny, uh, did you give yourself up because you were afraid? No, he was soon released and survived to become one of the most powerful Mafia bosses in the 1990s. Yeah, if you have uh, the number one law enforcement agency denying the existence of organized crime, certainly nobody else is, knows anything about it. So they operated for uh, 32 years with a complete immunity, and that gave them the ability to really corrupt the system. And then finally, uh, you know, when the uh, FBI starts to work on them, very quickly uh, they start to make a lot of cases. And then very quickly a uh, number of states and other agencies now realizing there is organized crime, they start to work uh, and they start to make cases. Why did they ignore them for so long? Well, uh, it could be a couple of reasons. It could be the fact that uh, uh, they, they didn't know that they were there. Uh, it could be the fact that they were so powerful and they had corrupted the entire system uh, on uh, higher levels uh, that possibly uh, uh, that J. Edgar Hoover decided that this was an area to stay away from. That politically it was wise for him to stay away from that area. You think that's possible? I think it's uh, very possible. I can't believe that the FBI was not aware of the existence of the LCN for 32 years in this country. In the summer of 1976, after a life of crime untroubled by law enforcement, Carlo Gambino passed away peacefully. Bequeathing a fortune to his sons and paving the way for a successor to inherit America's most powerful mafia family. I couldn't even count the flower cars. I mean, just, there had to be 75 to 100 cars just carrying flowers. And, um, I'd say the whole procession, there was a good 250 cars went to that funeral, you know. Um, and he just looked like the little old man that he was, you know, before, he, you know, when he was in the casket and stuff, on whatever they call it there. And um, the funeral went, it started about 10 in the morning from the, 
funeral parlor to the church, and I mean, we didn't get done with the burial till maybe five in the evening, because everything took so long. I mean, it was just it was like one massive traffic jam, you know, this big caravan. It was the Mafia's equivalent of a state funeral. As the Gambino family mourned the passing of their founding father, Mafia bosses from across America came to pay their final respects to a godfather who had become a legend. Not since Appalachian had so many Mafia bosses gathered together in one place. Well, the heads of all the families came in from uh, in, as far as California. You know, I mean, there's what, 25, 26 families. And they were all there, because that's what he was. He was the capo de tutte copy, they called it. You know, the boss of bosses. Yeah. Now there was a vacancy for a new boss of bosses. Paul Castellano, who had married Carlo Gambino's sister, was the leading candidate. Under the rules, the appointment of a new boss had to be approved by the commission and agreed within the family. If there are rival candidates, it can lead to civil war. Neil de la Croce was another contender for the throne. He had been a candidate back in 1957 after the murder of Albert Anastasia. Instead, Carlo Gambino had taken over and made him his underboss. Everybody was kind of worried because you didn't know who was going to be the boss now. And we had like two real factions of the family. There was the New York, the Manhattan faction and the Brooklyn faction. And that basically came down to whether Paulie was going to be the boss, Castellano, or um, Aniello Della Croce. When, when Carlo Gambino expired, uh, I think most people in law enforcement would have uh, put a bet down that the most likely successor was Aniello Della Croce. He's a very powerful man. Uh, he had the eyes of a killer. So you look in his eyes, you knew uh, he was a very bad man, a powerful man. Uh, he had a very strong personal contingent within the family that certainly would have wanted him to rise to that position. The child, who had grown up within the bosom of the Gambino family, found that he was now to play an important role in the battle for the succession to the throne. In the early 1970s, Dominic Montiglio had gone to Vietnam, joining the army against the wishes of his family. When the war broke out, I just felt that was the right thing to do. Um, of course, he was totally against it. You know, and that was another one of the times when I understood who we were. It's, you know, one of the things he told me, he says, you die for us, not for them. And I said, for who? He said, the government. He said, if you're going to die, you die for your family. And I said, well, this is my country, and this is the way I feel about it. And I went off much to... Um, his dislike. On his return from Vietnam, Montiglio's skills as a soldier were much in demand. My uncle uh, told me one afternoon, he said, go to Roy, over to the Gemini Lounge, and there's a package. Let him give you the package and bring it back home. Get your wife and the kids, they were all gone to my brother's house in Staten Island tonight. So I said, well, what's going on? And he said, we're going to make Paulie tonight. Okay. I went to the, uh, the Gemini, picked up the package, and it was a carbine, an M2 carbine, um, military. And my uncle told me that at 7 o'clock, the Manhattan faction was coming over, and that Paul, Tommy Bellotti, and him would be downstairs in his kitchen, and they were going to either make Paul the boss, or there was going to be a big war. He said there wasn't supposed to be any weapons at the meeting, but he was going to tape a gun underneath the kitchen table. And he said for me to get upstairs in my living room and put the garbage together, load it up, and there was a, a driveway that I could overlook, and that's the entrance they had to use to go in and out. And he said if I heard any shooting, just to shoot anybody that came out, because they would all be dead already inside my Uncle Paul, Tommy. And about, I guess about 7 o'clock, car pulled up with Paul and Tommy and maybe 10 minutes later the Manhattan crew got there and went downstairs and I just sat in the window with the sights down on the driveway and I saw the Manhattan crew 
come out in about a half hour, maybe less. They got in the car and drove away, and then Nino knocked on my door. Paulie and Tommy had already left also. Nino knocked on my door, and he says, come on down. We just made Paulie. Paulie's the new boss. And that was the, his ascension to the throne that night. Yeah. And he did the same thing that Carlo did. He made Delacroach the underboss. <laughs> you know, he used the same philosophy, and it worked again. Yeah. It was only 20 years later. But it was Paul Castellano who took over the mantle as the head of the Gambino family. He chose as his right-hand man and bodyguard a vicious gangster, Tommy Bellotti. Paul Castellano appeared to be just another successful businessman. He was an interesting man. He was uh, very gentle, soft-spoken, uh, loved business, read the Wall Street Journal every day, um, was very well self-taught, um, and loved to meet people and discuss business. Uh, he was really into business, buying businesses, uh, merging businesses, and loved the stock market, and loved, uh, loved business in general. Paul Castellano was a butcher by trade, so it was only natural that he went into that uh, uh, business, you know, on the uh, retail level. And he was a millionaire in his own right uh, in the meat industry. The Godfather became the distributor of one of America's largest food suppliers, Purdue Chicken. How did he get that contract, do you know? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the government alleged that he got the contract because Mr. Purdue felt that by using him, he would eliminate any labor problems. Uh, that was never proved, and uh, it was just an allegation. A world away from the supermarkets of Manhattan, in Canarsie, a rundown section of Brooklyn, Paul Castellano was earning millions of dollars a year from just one mafia crew. Their main activity was an organized car theft ring. The operation was masterminded by a capo who lived in luxury in a million dollar house on Long Island. This is Roy DeMeo was a psychotic killer whose crimes would eventually lead to the downfall of the Godfather. In the late 70s, he reported to Nino Gaggi, Dominic's uncle. His business deals were run out of a seedy bar on Flatlands Avenue known as the Gemini Lounge. It was there that Dominic Montiglio began his career in the Mafia. He introduced me to Roy as one of his friends. And um, the days following, we went to um, a bar Roy owned on Flatlands Avenue called the Gemini Lounge. And I met the people he had around him, who Nino said, you know, he said they're real sleepers, they're young kids, and they're just, you know, big time money earners, and they were all killers, you know. And um, we used to go on Friday nights, every Friday night for about well, four or five months, me and Nino, uh, to the Gemini, and then it got to where the crew, Roy's crew, Nino felt was doing a little bit too much to bring heat to them. So he stopped going, and I just had to go on Friday night. So I was the liaison between Roy and his crew and Paul. You know, I'd t take care of all the business between Roy and Paul because um, Roy had to go through me to see Paul. And Paul really didn't want to see him too much because that crew was bringing so much heat. You know, they were doing so much. Stolen cars and drugs and killings and that uh, Paul felt that if uh, he could keep Roy at arm's length, it would be a lot safer for him. The money from Roy DeMeo was secretly delivered to Castellano's Staten Island mansion known as the White House. The boss of bosses kept his distance from the street crimes of the family. But when another group of vicious killers in Manhattan began to cause problems for the Mafia in the late 1970s, the boss of bosses was forced to intervene personally. Disputes arose over building contracts at New York City's convention center between the Westies 
an Irish gang who ran some of the construction teams and the Mafia. They were also suspected of killing a powerful Mafia figure. The Godfather would be summoned to prevent an all-out war. In the late 70s, there was a uh, very notorious group uh, a disorganized Irishman called the Westies on the lower, on the west side of Manhattan. And they were causing problems. They were fringing on some Gambino and Genovese territories. So in late 1977, I'm sorry, the late 1970s, Castellano decided to enlist their support. He had a meeting with, uh, he had a meeting with Jimmy Coon and Mickey Featherstone, who were the leaders of Westies, and was able to uh, have that faction become a part of the Gambino family. Well, the Westies were, were a lot like the DeMeo crew in the sense where they'd kill you for nothing. I mean, they, they were even worse than the DeMeo crew, you know, as far as just having no reason. I mean, they killed just to have fun, you know. So, uh, yeah, nobody messed with them. The Italian mob never could control the West Side. They never had control over the Irish. They just could never do it before. And uh, they thought it would be beneficial to them if we connected up with them. And Jimmy thought it'd be beneficial, so we started uh, associating with them. Mickey was probably the most feared of all the Westies, you know. Um, I mean, to me, Mickey's, you know, a nice guy. I never had, you know, but from what you hear, you know, I mean, I met Mickey when I met him. He was all another kind of person than I expected. But you heard that, he would, that Mickey would just kill people and forget about that he even did it. Well, if people didn't pay up, either in Shylock money or shakedown money, they were told that I would come and I would be the one to get them, either hurt them or kill them. And you did that? Sure. Yes. The Westies were ruthless killers and loan sharks. Lending money at extortionate rates of interest, they used violence and murder to force repayment. They also borrowed money themselves from loan sharks, sometimes killing them to get rid of their debt. No one knows exactly how many people they murdered as they devised a gruesome method for getting rid of the evidence. This was a favorite disposal place for the Westies of bodies. And the Westies would cut the bodies up, uh, bring them up here, and have them disposed of through a contact of theirs and uh, the bodies would be somehow, or the parts, shot down to the bottom of these facilities and, uh, and then shot out into the river. The Westies made a fatal mistake when they murdered Ruby Stein, a mafia loan shark who was a big money earner for the New York families. Danny uh, Grillo stepped out from behind the kitchen door and he called something out to Ruby and Ruby turned and looked at him and Danny shot him and Danny gave the gun to Coon and Coon and shot him. Richie Ryan and Jimmy Coon and dragged him into the ladies room where they dismembered his body. Cut him up. I was waiting for Richie Ryan. I wanted to talk to him about what happened and uh, Nick the Greek came out just with the head in the bag put that in the trunk of his car, I mean the front seat of his car, then opened up his trunk and put the other body parts in different bags, black garbage bags in the trunk, and he drove off to wherever it was going to be dumped. The body was taken to the Westies dumping ground at the sewage plant on Randall's Island. But their usual efficient disposal of corpses went wrong, and evidence of their crime came to the surface. And this is where Ruby Stein's body, for example, uh, was disposed of and eventually surfaced out in, uh, or his torso, uh, Rockaway, near Kennedy Airport. Now, what the Westies were doing were killing Italians, which, you know, was getting real dangerous. And eventually, uh, Big Paul Castellano 
wanted us to call the Westies down for a meeting. And it was to find out if they were, in fact, the ones that killed Ruby Stein and to bring them into our fold. And the meeting was at um, Tommaso's restaurant on Bay 8th Street and 86th Street. It was a mafia sit down in Brooklyn. The Westies were suspected of murdering Ruby Stein. The mafia wanted to recover his black book, a record of millions of dollars out on the street in loans. If the Westies admitted the murder and taking the book, the mafia would kill them in revenge. The talk was about finding out about this black book that Ruby Stein left behind. It was, uh, like I tell you the names of customers, and it had quite a few million dollars in it of, you know, Shylock money, which customers had what. And, uh, well, if we denied killing Ruby, we wouldn't know where this black book was, you know. So that's the story that was stuck to. How could we know where the black book was if we had nothing to do with Ruby's death? And, uh, that lasted for just a minute or two, and Paul cut it off, and we went right into uh, what our relationship would be, the Westies and the Gambinos. Featherston and his boss could have been killed for what they had done. But the presence of Paul Castellano inside Tommaso's restaurant allayed their fears. The thing was, once we knew Paul was there, we knew we were safe. Because if somebody's going to be whacked, he's not going to be sitting in the restaurant. Castellano set out new rules under which the Westies would operate with his protection. That anything we did to make money, that we made money on, the Gambinos would get 10% of the profits. And uh, we weren't allowed to kill anybody anymore on... Uh, spur the moment, you know, without asking permission. And uh, we would become under the Gambino, we would be under the Gambino's wing, which is under their protection. And uh, we would have more power on the west side as far as if there was trouble with other mob people from different areas of the city, they would be told who we were with, and they would back off. Featherston, the second in command, spent just four years in jail for his crimes. He testified against the Mafia and the Westies, and is now free under the Federal Witness Protection Program. In the late 70s, the alliance between the Westies and the Mafia represented the height of their respective powers. The most advantageous thing was that they could get the money to put out on the street. You know, um, that was number one. Number two, they could get the okays to do certain businesses without stepping on anybody's toes. Um, and in turn, they delivered the West Side to the Gambinos. So it was a, it was a, a pretty good um, alliance, you know. One of their rackets on the west side was controlling employment on one of the city's main tourist attractions, the World War II aircraft carrier, the USS Intrepid. Friends and associates were given jobs, and when the managers objected, the Irishmen threatened to cut the ship loose and float it down the Hudson. But the Westies were also hardened killers, a skill that Castellano and the Gambino family could well appreciate. As a result of this, Paul had his own little murder-for-hire gang who would do any kind of killings or strong-arm work anywhere in the city. And uh, because of that, they were always known as, like, Paul's secret army because he always had, like, a secret weapon. Any dirty work, Paul had all these Westies who would go out and kill anybody any place at any time. What was Roy DeMaio's job? Roy's job was to oversee the operation of the Westies, uh, give them the orders, and also, more importantly, bring back the money which they would earn to pass on to Gaggi and ultimately up to uh, Castellano. If anything, the Westies were even more brutal than the Mafia themselves. Untroubled by law enforcement, they simply co-opted the Westies to do much of their dirty work. With the Westies under the supervision of the DeMeo crew, the Gambino family was at the peak of its powers in the late 70s. 
you're talking about probably the two most feared crews that I have since Murder Incorporated back in the 40s. You know, I mean, people were terrified of both crews. To have them together, you know, was incredible. You know, it's, it was a big coup. It was a coup which had gone largely unnoticed by law enforcement. The legacy of 30 years of neglect was still being felt in the late 1970s. It was only then that the FBI developed a coherent strategy by setting up dedicated squads to shadow each of the five New York families. The largest is the Gambino squad. In 1980, we had to start from uh, ground zero. Uh, the FBI had not worked the family as such for a number of years. So basically for the first year we had to do intelligence, identify all the key players, identify the boss, center boss, what they were doing, where they were talking, all the particular criminal activities, and put together a big intelligence package. Were you surprised back then that in fact you knew remarkably or relatively little about the Gambino family? <laughs> when we took over the squad in uh, 1980, there was not an open case on Paul Castellano, who was the boss, Neil Della Croce, the underboss, or Joanne Gallo. So to me, that was surprising. Under the leadership of Bruce Mao, a veteran of the Cold War, all that was about to change. One of their first intelligence targets was the underboss, Neil Delacroach. As early as 1977, the police had in fact started to accumulate surveillance film on the comings and goings at the Ravenite Club in Little Italy. The FBI began to identify who these figures were and what they were doing. They caught an early glimpse of the gangster who was later to haunt them with his mocking jibes of invincibility, John Gotti. Well, that was Della Croce's club. Uh, John Gotti, Angelo Ruggiero, um, Willie Boy. Uh, that was the Manhattan faction of the Gambinos. And um, we very rarely went to each other's clubs. You know, it was like uh, the Chris Christmas time. You know, everybody made the rounds. And um, I was in the Raven Hunt maybe seven, eight times. And it was always, either, it was either on a Christmas or just to bring a message. And, you know, I never would hang out there. You know, we stayed basically in Brooklyn. Over in Queens was another Gambino social club, the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club, which was now also targeted by the FBI. This seemed to be an even more promising location to launch their new assault on the Mafia. And in 1981, uh, after a lot of work, a lot of intelligence, and a lot of contact with informants, uh, we discovered what we consider to be the weak link, and that was known as the uh, Bergen Hunt and Fish Crew, led by John Gotti. The FBI zeroed in on John Gotti's closest friend, an overweight chain-smoking gangster called Angelo Ruggiero. In uh, 1981, uh, we were able to install electronic listening devices in the home of Angelo Ruggiero, who was a very close associate of John Gotti, and uh, he was then a member of the, of the Gambino crime family. Uh, Ruggiero had a uh, particular problem, and that is he, he talked too much. There was nothing the FBI liked more than wise guys who talked too much. Even within the mafia, Ruggiero was known as Quack Quack. With court approval, they put a bug in his home. That bug was just a gold mine of information. Uh, we obtained detailed information regarding the workings of the family, meetings at Castellano's house, all the politics, all the interaction, meetings at Della Croce's house. But more importantly, uh, we literally stumbled into a major narcotics operation, which was engineered by Ruggiero, which also implicated a fellow named Gene Gotti, John's younger brother, a guy named John Coniglia, other members of his crew. And it turned out to be a major uh, heroin trafficking network. The loose tongue of Gotti's friend was a breakthrough for the FBI. It not only provided evidence which they could use to bring a case against Angelo Ruggiero, it also provided them with what is legally known as probable cause, the required proof to place bugs in other locations. Now they could secretly bug the home of underboss Neil Delacroach. They could even contemplate what had previously been unthinkable, putting a secret microphone inside the house of the most powerful mafia boss in the country. 
he ran the Gambino crime family, and the Gambino crime family uh, at that time was the most powerful crime family in the United States. So um, I have to say that he was, he was probably the most powerful mobster in the country. Within the space of two years, the FBI would achieve their most spectacular coup in the war against organized crime. Nobody ever really thought that uh, you could make a criminal case against a guy like that. He was viewed as untouchable by law enforcement. Next week, we reveal how the FBI brought down the most powerful godfather in America and the Civil War, which threatened to tear the Mafia apart. <laughs>